Um, how many of you are familiar with the, um, the viney, go wherever it wants, incredibly um, ornery plant known as wisteria? How many of you are familiar with wisteria or have ever had a wisteria plant? How many of you ever had one of these? Yeah, so you know. You know. So many of you know that um, I have um, always kind of worked a lot. In fact, when I was really young, 12 years old, I ended up actually moving out of my house and I lived in a campground in another state and I worked full time for an entire summer um, at, a, at a campground when I was 12 years old. I'm not afraid of a little hard work. Um, in fact, I kind of enjoy it sometimes. Well, one of my many things that I've done, and the staff is probably laughing because they hear about you know, all the jobs that I've had. Um, I actually worked for a landscaping company um, out of Cape May, New Jersey. It was owned by uh, um, uh, family friends of ours. And um, we would go around and obviously do landscaping jobs. Well, we get a phone call from this uh, sweet little old lady. And she called and she said, would you come and, and just trim a little bit of my wisteria? And so we thought, sure, no problem. Although, um, whenever a little sweet old lady calls and says, would you do this, a little bit of this, that's actually a code for run the other way. Um, So we pulled up to this Cape Cod style house and it had black shutters, bright red door. I mean, this thing was just cute. It was a cute house. Front yard was beautifully manicured. I mean, it looked so nice in the front. And, uh, and I can remember looking and I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be easy. You know, if she spent half the amount of time on the backyard as she's already done in the front yard, we're going to be okay. And uh, so I jump up in the back of the truck and I remember looking up and just peeking over the roof line of this little Cape Cod style house was um, this bright green um, kind of bushy tree. And, and I was looking at that, and I remember thinking, I'm like, wow, I'm like, that's a really bushy tree, considering that it's kind of small, you know, I mean, and it's peeking up over the house, right? And it's very full, you know, and uh, especially for summertime in, in Cape May, New Jersey. So we start to walk around the side of the house, and we come to the back of the house, and it became very apparent that the amount of time that uh, was spent on the front was the only time that was spent <laughs> on the landscaping of the house. And, um, and all of a sudden, when I come around the corner to what do my wandering eyes should appear, um, but it was the wisteria from Hades. And I mean, and, and it, was, it, it was unbelievably overgrown. Um, so some of the trunks on this wisteria literally were like five inches around. I mean, do you know what it takes, how long it takes for a wisteria vine. So it's a plant. Technically, it's a plant, but it's a viney plant. So it's a plant that has vines. So the vines are growing everywhere, and they're taking over. I mean, they have waged war on this poor woman's backyard, and they were winning. So here's the amazing thing. There was this metal trellis somewhere in this And we could like see the outline of it, but it was like partially existent, partially it wasn't. You could see it in some places and other places you were like, what has happened? And we asked the lady, you know, "Um, oh, when was the trellis installed? And she goes, oh dear, that was 1982. Okay, 1982. At this point, it's 1997. And, uh, and this wisteria literally had, had lifted this metal trellis eight inches off the ground. So... So the wisteria basically got to the point they were like, metal trellis, I mean, what do you think you're going to do? And it started to lift the trellis, and it was carrying it away. I mean, it was just carrying it away. And this sweet little old lady, you know, she said, now I really want to enjoy the the blossoms and the blooms of, of my wisteria. So anybody that knows wisteria knows that there's really two primary times that you do pruning of wisteria, fall and early spring. That's kind of the two primary times. It blooms wonderfully in the summer, and then after the summer, it, um, it, it, when it's done blooming, it's just kind of green, right? And, and then you can wait until fall and, and prune it back, and then you do a little bit of maintenance stuff on it in the early spring, and then it comes beautiful blooms in the summer. In order for the wisteria to really bloom beautifully, you have to prune it. I don't recommend that you wait 15 years to start pruning your wisteria. If, just FYI, if you were thinking, you know, there was, I just thought, how long should I wait? Don't wait 15 years. Um, it's not worth it. 
So, so she said, we really want to see the bloom. So we, we, we decided, okay, we're going to have to be kind of meticulous about this. We're going to have to go in, and we're going to have to cut very strategically. First of all, we had to get the trellis back on the ground, which was, a, which was an event in itself. I never found myself talking to a plant like I talked to this wisteria. We were arguing with each other. I mean, no kidding. The wisteria was like, don't you let go. Of, I'm going to hold on to this. You and I'm like, I'm over there sawing it going, how does this feel? Huh? You know? <laughs> Think you can beat me? I'm the one with the saw, you know? And uh, so we're going into that. And, but we're very, very strategic in the process of trying to release this metal trellis from the hands of this wicked wisteria. And in the midst of all of that, I started to think to myself, wow, there's a sermon in this, isn't there? I'm, I'm preaching already, aren't I? Hopefully. I mean, because the truth is, if you think about it, when we walked up to the house, our first thought was, wow, if the, if the backyard looks at all like the front yard, we're going to be okay. And everything looked wonderful. But as soon as we went around the back, it was like, oh, my word, <laughs> not the same. How true is that for us sometimes? You know, by appearances, everything can look like the front yard of this nice lady's home. It looks great. It's beautifully manicured. We spend a lot of time on it. And it looks to appearances like everything's wonderful and life is great. But the truth is, how often do we not have a gnarly, viney, wicked wisteria growing inside of us? And the truth is for us, we just like that wisteria, need to constantly have a schedule, if you will, or a daily time, or any time, to go in front of the gardener and to say, I'm overgrown, this thing's choking me out, it's choking the life out of me, it's taking me away from the desire that I have to live, and I need to be pruned, right? I need to be pruned, well, you know what? Let's go to a passage of Scripture where Jesus talks exactly about what I'm referencing this morning. Turn with me to John 15. John 15, it's, it's uh, page 824 in your pew Bibles. And, it, and, and as kind of I like to do while you're turning to John 15, I'm going to give you a little backstory here. So Jesus at this point had already told his disciples, listen, tonight's the night. Tonight's the night. I'm going to be betrayed and Judas, had, at this point, had already left the upper room. They just finished the meal. So they had already gotten to the place where they ate the meal together. They were finishing up the Passover meal. And he says, let's go, and we need to go out to the Garden of Gethsemane. Which is an interesting place to go, because the Garden of Gethsemane is a place where olive oil would have been produced. And it's the place where, I mean, beautiful olive trees and olive groves. And on the way there, Jesus stops to teach them another lesson. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing that on his way to the garden where he knows he's going to have to pray, literally almost in anguish, to his heavenly Father, he sees another opportunity to teach his disciples. How cool is that? I, I want to be discipled by that, don't you? I want to be discipled by, by Jesus who, in the midst of this moment, he probably goes by and maybe it was a wall or maybe he was actually, because of this lush landscape, it was a vineyard path that he was, that he was walking on. And all of a sudden, he goes over and he sees this vine, this creepy vine that maybe is, is interwoven through uh, a fence like this. And he says to his disciples, I want to teach you what this means. Folks, he is moments away from being arrested, beaten, and crucified, and he's still teaching them all the way. That's amazing. That's amazing, isn't it? And, and so he stops and he says, I want to teach you about this vine and the importance of this message. So let's read together um, in John 15. And um, so starting at verse 1. He says, I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. 
Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me, and I in them, will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me, and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want, and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. Let's, let's read that again. Can we read that again? When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. Powerful words. Here's the thing. Remember we talked about contextual preaching that Jesus does, or contextual teaching. If he's meeting with a bunch of fishermen, he teaches about fishing things, and they understand it. When he's teaching to a bunch of farmers, he brings up seeds and sowing, and he talks about farmer language, and they understand it. Here he's talking about basically how to grow and nurture and take care of vines, but he's doing it to a group of zealots, tax collectors, and fishermen. <laughs> what do they know about vines and branches? And, and the truth is, they know enough to know how they work. They know enough that there is an important lesson that Jesus is trying to teach them in this moment, right before he's about to be arrested. And they didn't know that he was about to be arrested, but he did, and he wanted to teach him this lesson. So what's interesting is Jesus, in one lesson, sums up the entire chain of command in the universe. So, so um, Max Locato kind of helped me with this in, in coming up with the, the reference points here. So this is, this is basically the chain of command in this lesson that we can see. Are you ready? God is the gardener. Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. And our lives should produce much fruit. Now, I left, I left actually accidentally. I should have had much fruit because the scripture kept saying much fruit, not just fruit, right? It doesn't say just fruit in general. It actually says much fruit. They will know that you're my disciples by much fruit that you produce. So it's God is the gardener. Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. And our lives should produce much fruit fruit. So I think that there's a couple of pieces in this scripture that I want to unpack just, just, just briefly um, for us. And the first one really comes right out of uh, the first verse. So the first verse, and this is something that I've missed before. I've read this passage hundreds of times, honestly. But I missed the powerful truth, <clears throat> as I hit puberty one more time, I missed the powerful truth of what Jesus was communicating right off the bat in verse 1. Look at verse 1 with me. What does it say? I am the true vine. I am the true grapevine. So if that's true, then what does that lead us to believe? That there are false grapevines. That there are false vines. He is making it really clear to us that he is the one and only true vine. At this point, John 13, while they were sitting in the upper room, they were eating together the Passover meal. Do you remember what he says to them? He says, there will be some that will come along. There will be many that come along and say that he's the Messiah or that they're a prophet or they're the Messiah. And he says, don't listen to them. He says, because what are they? They're sheep in what? Wolves' clothing. Remember last week we talked about Jesus being the good shepherd. He lays down his life for the sheep. And what we understood that to be is he places himself in as the gate, the barrier between the sheep and the attackers. Jesus at that moment is telling them, you can't listen to the false prophets and to the other people that are come and say, I'm the Messiah. He says, because it's not true. I am the only true vine. Now, here's the amazing thing for us to realize this morning. He isn't talking just to a bunch of disciples 2,000 years ago. He wants to communicate the same message to you and I this morning. You have to realize that there are a lot, many false vines in your life. The false vines in your life tell you, oh, just, just do what I do, or just follow me. I'll, I'll, I'll take care of you. No, 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 give, give to me this, or give to me that. And there's always a giving, isn't there? Give, give, give. And it's a false vine. And Jesus wants to communicate to you this morning specifically as well that he is the only true vine. 
The only true vine is Jesus. We have to be careful not to believe that other vines in our lives that are telling us, oh, just remain in me. Because Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. I am the only true vine. So it's amazing. Uh, verse 2 seems to be a, almost like a conflict of language. Doesn't it look, kind of look like that? So let's look at verse 2 again. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. And he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they will produce even more. So he cuts off and he prunes. Uh, to our English ears, those mean the same thing, don't they? I mean, when you think about when you prune something, how do you prune something without what? Cutting it off. But the truth is, our English ears get this confused, and there's really not a good English translation for what, for what um, the translators were, were speaking into this. Because the truth is, that word prune in the Greek means pruning or cleaning. So cut off also means to take away. So basically the scripture is telling us that he takes away every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. There is a process of cutting, right? And it's cutting off at the stem. And it's, it's not producing fruit anymore. It's a, it's a vine or it's a, it's a branch that's dead and you have to cut it off. It's not producing fruit. And then there's other part of that, but the pruning process. So here's the cool thing that I learned in this process. The vine dressers people that took care of the health of the vines, they would actually come and they would recognize that there were branches that had kind of fallen down below. And the branches that fell literally were kind of covered in dirt and they were getting choked out by the other branches and the sun wasn't actually getting on them. So the vine dresser doing his role, he would go down, pick up these branches and he would clean them off. That's what the Greek means. The Greek means, yes, there is a moment when the vine gets, or the branches get cut off. But the pruning that we're reading about here is a cleaning that's happening. So the vine dresser cleans off the branch. And you know what the vine dresser does? Places it back up on top with the other branches so that it can receive the sun's nourishment and grow healthy again. Can I get it a little amen? I mean, just, I mean, y'all just bear with me and just amen along the way so I know you're tracking. I don't want to have to go back because that would just be embarrassing. So the vine dresser picks up the branch. No, I'm just kidding. I won't do that to you. <laughs> but isn't that good news for us? So cut off and pruning are two different things. Well, we have to understand that language, but they are distinct in what they do. So in the process of cleaning or pruning the branches, he also cuts off the diseased parts of the vine, of the, I'm sorry, of the branch. So it's amazing when we think about the vine dresser coming up and he takes a look at the branches and he says, oh, you know, this is, mm, this is no good here. This is anger. Anger needs to go. It just has to. Oh, man, this one too. Wow. Oh, this one's lust. This thing is just diseased. If I let it stay on the, on the branch too long, it'll end up diseasing the rest of the branch. I, I can't have that. I've got to cut that one off. Oh, yeah, this one too. Pride. Mm. That one. Oh, this one over here. I remember this one too. I feel like I've cut this one off before, but it, it just keeps growing back. Bad relationships. Oh, yeah, this one's pretty close, too. Oh, man, this just, I know, I know this hurts. Selfishness. But see, they're all diseased. And so if we allow diseased branches to stay and diseased parts of the branches to stay, it'll end up diseasing the rest, and then it'll stop producing fruit. And it'll cease to be what it was designed to be, which is a fruit-bearing plant. The truth is, this is a powerful image for us. When we look at this, we, we can't help but, but realize that there are parts of our own lives that we need to allow the gardener to prune off of us. And it's a powerful image. But, the, but I have to tell you, I don't think it's the main point of what Jesus wants to communicate to us this morning. Truth be told, as I kind of alluded to in my prayer, Jesus has been teaching me what it's like to literally be discipled by him. 
What, it, what does it mean to literally get into a, a place where I can be discipled by Jesus and speak to Jesus as if he's in the room? Because the truth of that is, he is. He is in the room. And you know what? When we realize that he's in the room, it changes the way that we act. It changes the way that we think. It changes what we do. It changes decisions that we make. And and I know that that sounds hard. And even if you're going back to your early childhood days, it sounds like a threat, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Because I grew up that that was kind of a threat. The, The threat was always, well, don't do that. Jesus is watching. Jesus is, is with you, so, so don't act that way. And it was always this threat. We always treat Jesus as if he's some cop around the corner just waiting for us to, to pull us over for speeding. And the truth is, that's not the relationship that Jesus desires to have with us. Jesus desires to <laughs> pick up the shears and to say, I know this hurts, but it's for your best. I know this doesn't feel good, but you need to go through it because there's diseased parts of your branch. And if you let them stay, they're going to infect the rest of the branch. So I just simply stopped in my preparation to preach this message. And I said, Jesus, I said, what would you have me preach this morning? What's the point that you want me to make? And you know what? Through the power of the Holy Spirit, which again I believe is a gift, that comes from above. We, we believe James 1.17. All good gifts come from above. I think that understanding of gifts needs to be expanded a little bit. We tend to think that gifts is like, you know, I got a package or, you know, a birthday present. But it's not. Thoughts that the Holy Spirit plants into our hearts and in our heads is a gift from above. And if you listen intently to what Jesus wants to speak into your life, you can guarantee you will hear from him. Now listen, you might not like what he says. But he says it because he loves you. He, he, oh, that's later in the message. I can't get ahead of myself. <laughs> I'll come back to that. So the amazing thing for us is, is I asked Jesus, I said, what, do you want, what do you want the main purpose, the main point to be? And you know what he said? He said, I want people to remain in me. He said, he said deep within my spirit. In that moment, I literally stopped listening. I started writing. And I was trying to listen and write at the same time, but I didn't want to stop listening because, I mean, you're just flowing thoughts and just flowing. And he said, everybody talks about the fruit. Everybody talks about this passage being about the fruit. It's not about the fruit. He says, because you can never produce fruit without me. So the truth is, you have to get to the point where you first remain in me, and then we can talk about the fruit. See, that's the power of this message. It's not about the fruit. It's about remaining connected to the vine. Because when you remain connected to the vine, what does the scripture say? Then you will produce what? Much fruit. So uh, I always, I pictured this in my head um, of this tiny little branch, right? And this little branch is kind of out here and and you can all pretend like you're the little branch and you've got your arm out and you just want to produce one grape. Now granted, you ever seen grapes like luscious clusters of grapes? They're gorgeous and beautiful and you look at them and you go how in the world was this created right I mean it's just amazing and I know you're all kind of getting hungry right now so these luscious grapes but this little branch decides I'm going to produce a grape without the vine you watch so this little branch is kind of like right (laughs) you know and it keeps trying and it keeps trying and it's getting nowhere all of a sudden the vine comes along and the vine's like you know I can help you with that I get it vine I get it no 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 I'm the branch I can do this without you don't you worry and the vine's like oh okay you know go for it and that little vine starts turning or that little branch starts turning red and then it turns purple which is ironic because that's the color of grapes and still no grapes are formed No grapes are formed. Will that vine ever, I'm sorry, I keep doing that. Will that branch ever produce a grape? No. Why? Because it needs the vine. It needs the vine. So then I started thinking, how can I teach this to the people? Like that was a fun little analogy, but we got to go a step further. So how do we do that? This is what I came up with. You can laugh at me if you want. I thought about... A cord 
and a light bulb. Now, check this out. I want you to track with me here. I want you to picture that this power cord right here, okay, is the vine. This right here, this cord with the fruit on top is the branch, okay? Now, I'm going to make that light up. Are you ready? (laughs) Wait a minute, wait a minute. (laughs) Right? Y'all are laughing because you're like, okay, pastor, just get to the point. Because you already know the point, don't you? This will cease to light up until it is placed in the branch or the vine. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Would have been really awkward if I plugged it in and it didn't light up. (laughs) Like, I mean. (laughs) But think about the simplicity but the power in that message. If this is the vine and the source of what you need to produce fruit is in this vine, you have to get to the place where you realize that as a branch, you won't be purposeful and your life will not produce fruit until you connect it to the source. Until you connect it to the source. This is powerful imagery. Jesus is the vine. We are the branches and our purpose is to produce much fruit. It won't happen until we connect to the source. Because here's the point of the message. The point of the message is not about fruit. In fact, I want to challenge you to recognize this morning through this passage that we've read, Jesus never once commands his disciples to bear fruit. You, you can look. It's not there. I'll give, you, I'll give you a heads up. I mean, you know, but I, honestly, don't take my word for it. Don't ever take a preacher's word for it. Always go back and search it for yourself. Make sure that they're up to snuff. Truthfully. You know, I mean, because as much as I try very, very hard, guess what? I'm still human. And we need to trust that the Holy Spirit's going to guide us into all truth, not Pastor Steve. So here's the incredible thing. You can look in the passage, Jesus never once commands that his disciples produce fruit. In fact, the point of the power, the message is not in the fruit, it's actually in remaining in him. So so here's the amazing thing. Look at it with me as we look at the at the verse by verse. Verse four, remain in me, and I will remain in you. You cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Verse 5, those who remain in me and I in them may or may not, the jury's still out, they can but they might not, it's, we're not really sure, produce much fruit. Obviously you get where I'm going, that's not what it says. What does the word say? Those who remain in me and I in them, say it with me, will produce much fruit. Who doesn't remain in me is thrown away. Remain in me and my words remain in you. That's verse 7. Verse 9, remain in my love. Verse 10, when you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. This message is not about the fruit. It's about remaining in Christ. He says you'll never even produce fruit. You'll never even think about producing fruit until you recognize that the only way you can is if you abide in Christ, the vine. The vine looks at us this morning and says, I want your life to produce fruit. I desire for your life to produce fruit. I will do everything within my ability. But the truth is, as much as we try and as hard as, I mean, we, we can be like that person who has that beautiful front yard and we can make it look amazing and incredible and, uh, and, and we can even look like we're, we're spending a lot of time with the vine and it can look awesome and it can even look close and tight But the truth is, no matter how close you get, it's not going to happen until you connect to the source. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. It actually says, he says, if you remain in me, doesn't he? If you remain in me, which means choice. 
And he leads them to, to this final place where he says, remain in my love. What does he say in John 13 about that whole aspect? Well, this isn't the first time that, he, that he, they hear him say, love each other. This isn't the first time. In John 13, at the end of the Passover meal, he says, they will know you by your fruits, by your actions, and by your love. They will know you and how much you love each other. Folks, can I tell you that we won't struggle as a congregation to love each other if we're remaining in Christ? We won't struggle to have relationships with, with people. We won't struggle to love e- each other or out, you know, people out in this world if we are remaining connected to the vine. Because Jesus is going to give us the power for our lives to produce much fruit. But without him, here's the important thing we have to always remember. Without him, we can do nothing. We can do nothing without the vine. It's amazing. That's the reason why Jesus demands, he doesn't demand his disciples to bear fruit because he realizes that apart from him, he can do nothing. So for us this morning, I know that it's certainly not easy. It's certainly not easy to turn our lives over to the gardener. I get that. It's not easy turning our lives over to the gardener. Because the pruning process, even that cleaning process, and that cutting off of the diseased parts of our lives, it's hard. And it hurts. But I can tell you that it is so beneficial to your spiritual growth. You have to place yourself in the hands and at the feet of the gardener. And he's going to take his shears. And if you allow him, he will begin to prune and to cut off the things that are, that are potential disease, uh, diseases for the other parts of the branch. And it's, it hurts. And I know it's hard. But it's incredibly rewarding. It's worth it. And Jesus believes that you're worth it. And for us... You know, the piece that we have to ask ourselves is, okay, it's not about producing the fruit. The fruit's going to happen. He's going to do that work. But for us, it's remaining in the vine. It's abiding in Christ. I want you to ask this question of yourself right now. Just quietly say to yourself, Jesus, what does it look like for me to remain in you? Just ask yourself that question right now. If you want to close your eyes, if you want to picture Jesus with us, because guess what? He's here. And you want to ask him this question, Jesus, what does it look like for me to remain in you? What does it look like for me to abide in you? Allow Jesus to shape what that looks like for you. Allow him to share with you. Maybe this morning you're at a place where you need to also ask Jesus, Jesus, what is it that needs to be cut off the branch? What is it that is getting in the way? What is it that's diseased and that could cause disease in the other areas of my life? What do I, Jesus, I want you to prune me this morning. Let's just take a few minutes. Let's just, let's just listen. Let's just listen. I'm just going to pray, and I'm going to ask, invite you all to stand with me as I pray. And then after I'm done praying, we're going to sing a closing song that affirms the love that Jesus has for us and his desire for us to remain in his love. Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, Jesus, as I contemplate the power of this message, It's so intentional for us this morning. You were about to be led off to your death. 
and use Saul a moment to be able to communicate a powerful message to your disciples. You see, they knew that they weren't going to be with you anymore. And you said to them, even if I'm gone, remain in me and I will remain in you. You were looking at them like I believe you look deeply and longingly at us this morning and say to us, you say to us, don't trust the other vines around you or the other false teachings, or the false idols, or the prophets who say they come in my name, but just trust in you, the true and one and only vine. Lord, you are the true vine. And I pray this morning that we would be recognizing the need as we branches, how much we need you to supply us with nourishment. So Heavenly Father, I pray that you again would just be speaking incredible amounts of truth into us right now. And Jesus, I am thankful for your love that never fails. I'm thankful for your love that never gives up. I'm thankful for your love that never runs out. I'm thankful for your love that that sometimes tells us hard things. I'm thankful for your love that picks up the shears and cuts off the things that we need to be cut off of our, of our branches, Lord. I'm thankful for the love that, that meets us where we are, that doesn't wait for us to be a clean and perfect vine, but meets us in our diseasedness and, and begins to purify us so that we can produce much fruit in the future, recognizing, Lord, that the only ability to produce fruit is because we remain attached to you, our vine. So Jesus, meet with us as we close our time this morning. It's in your name that we pray all these things. Amen. Love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. higher than the mountains that I face, and it's stronger than the power of the grave, and it's constant in the trial and the change, this one thing. This one thing remains. Sing it out. Your love never fails. Your love never fails. Never gives up. Never runs out on me. Your love never fails. Never gives up. Never runs out on me. Your love never And on and on and on and on it goes And it overwhelms and satisfies my soul And I'll never ever have to be afraid Cause this one thing remains This one thing remains 
fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Oh, your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love. Sing it out. And on and on. Can we give God a hand clap of praise this morning? So take a look at this. This is as of today, right now, all the ones that have been taken, which is pretty amazing. We have um, 155 ones have been taken so far, and we want to keep going. Amen? We want to keep pushing forward, and uh, if you hadn't had the opportunity to turn in your pledge card, please know you can turn in your pledge anytime, um, and then on the 26th, even if you want to bring your pledge and your gift with you on the 26th, you can do that as well. We want to keep this um, God-sized because it's God-sized, amen? And, uh, and I just want to encourage you as well, uh, you know, the power of that song is, um, is the fact that... Uh, we always, I know that when the writer was writing it, when they said that your love never runs out, we understand that to be when he pours out his love. His love is constantly pouring out. But I had this epiphany a while back when we were singing this song once, that many of us in our life, we've had people that have ran out on us. We had people that have just left us and they've run out and you're left to, to, to feel the effects of that. A lot of them times just devastated. Can I tell you this morning, can I speak life into you and tell you that Jesus never runs out on you? Jesus never runs out on you. And that's the truth and the power of the message this morning. And I pray that this week that we will continue to just remain in him and allow him and his life-giving power to produce fruit in us. Amen? Amen. Would you uh, say the benediction with us this morning? And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen.